We've been talking about favor that brings good success. A message which the Lord had laid in my heart a few, a few months ago, and which I have developed, I have written it down, it is in my heart. So allow me to move to point number two. Point number one that we had last Sunday was that uh, we learned that um, favor begins with parental blessings. Parental blessings, where God reveals himself to you, or God's word is revealed to you. And we saw, as we were learning last Sunday, for just for the sake of us connecting with what I want to talk about this morning, that in Genesis chapter 28, verse 1 to verse 5, Jacob was released officially by his father. We are talking about Jacob as a character who experienced the favor of God. So please pick it up from David if you're here for the first time. Especially the hands I saw lifted up being here for the first time. You may be wondering what is a pastor talking about. We've been talking about favor, favor, favor. What is given to us that we don't deserve. And we realize that uh, the best character we can study is the character of Jacob, who represents, to me, the father of the church, the Old Testament church. And of course, the church in the Old Testament and the New Testament is just a replica of the same. So when, if we can learn from Jacob a few things, they will help us to understand how the favor of God operates in the lives of believers. So chapter 28, Genesis 1 to 5, to connect with you, we realize that when this man was living his father's place in Canaan and running away, as we normally put it, to his uncle's place in the land of Haran, we discovered that this man didn't go without the blessings of his parents. As much as many of us think Jacob was running away from his brother, yes, he was. Because the intent that he had and uh, what he had conspired with his mother was that when he gets to the land of Haran, he should never leave that land until his father is dead and until his brother has been appeased of the evil that he had done against him. Oh, of course we know. He had taken away the birthright of his brother Esau. So, chapter 28, verse 1 to 5, tells us what the father pronounced on him. And I think it's very important for me to pick it up from here. So that as I establish point number two, it will go well with you in connecting with this. The blessing of his father was the blessing of Abraham. Because that's what God had given Abraham from the start. If there was anything that this man were doing in the land of Canaan, were the promise that God had given to Abraham, that this land I will give you, that I will make you a father of many nations. I will multiply you and I will bless you. And you will become the father of all the families of the earth. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So this was the word which Abraham was carrying with him from God. And I believe it's the same, same word that Abraham spoke to Isaac before he died. Now, Isaac is passing this word to the next person who would be the bearer of that promise, what we are calling here your offspring. And who receives this word? This word is given to Jacob as he's running away from his brother. To signify to me, even though Esau remained at home, Esau never inherited anything that was any close to that blessing. So if you look in chapter 28, verse 1 to 5, just to connect you, it says, and Isaac called Jacob. Isaac called Jacob. Very significant here. Jacob never just packed himself his, the goods and ran away because he was running away from his brother. Of course, I shared last Sunday the conspiracy that was there between Jacob and uh, Rebekah and, and, of course, with uh, Isaac. But Isaac, the father, called him, never understanding behind what was going to happen when this man gets where he's going to. But the blessing was released because of favor. That's what I'm talking about here. Just the favor of God was enough to release that blessings upon this young man. He called him and he said, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Pad Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel. Bethuel was the uncle, the brother to Rebekah. Then he said, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Now, chapter, the, the Bible goes on to say, then he began to pronounce the blessing. And this is very key for our understanding because this will tie up to everything in the life of Jacob. Up to the time when Israel is going to the land of, Ke I mean, the land of Egypt, all this is tied together. So he said, if you can read with me, all the God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of people. A company of people. Now, what was he doing? He was simply releasing what God had told Abraham when he was leaving the land of Haran. You remember? Chapter 12, verse 1. When he told Abraham, arise and go to a land where I will give to you. Then he said, I will bless you and I will make you great and you will become a father of many. You will be a blessing to the families of the earth. But he did not end there. 
he went further now to affirm that blessing. And you can see it in the following verse. He said, may he give, help me here, what? The blessing? I want to see whether you're with me. The blessing of who? Abraham. The blessing of Abraham to you. Now, remember the brother is at home. And this man is living. So he's releasing the blessing of Abraham to him. May you receive the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you. That you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. In other words, you may take possession of the places that Abraham has walked in. In this land which God promised to give to Abraham. Then the Bible says, thus Isaac sent Jacob away. Very significant for you to note. So if you are a preacher like me, who was preaching that Jacob ran away from his brother, please change your preaching. He never ran away. He was sent by his father. That's the aspect to me that is more significant to me. Forget about the other things behind there. Or whatever he was going to do in the land of Laban, he now sent him. And I'm trusting God that when he was sending him, he raised his hand on him. And he said, son, may the Lord be with you. And may the Lord bless you. And may you go and prosper where you are going. May you go and multiply where you are going. So the father sent him away. And he went to Padam Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the, Ar 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 the Ar Aramian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Now, very significant to note, the blessing of your father. What I mentioned in the third service, I say the parental blessing. I normally say this. Remember, favor begins. The Bible says, and you will find favor with God and men. And before men begin to release that blessing in you, very key and very, very important here, covet parental blessings. Seek for parental blessings. I don't need to overemphasize. I don't know why I'm feeling like I should overemphasize this. Because your parents hold the key to your blessing. Remember? Remember the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother, and it will be well with you, and you will live long life. So your welfare is actually tied to the blessings of your parents. And I, let me make this very clear. If you, you have any issue with your parent, and you want the Lord to bless you, gain courage. Just gain courage. Go to them and tell them, Daddy, Mommy, I've been having this grudge with you. I've been feeling like something has not been right with me. It doesn't matter whether your father is a drunkard, whether he is a whatever, or your mother is wherever. It doesn't matter how you were born. It doesn't matter how you were raised. Just go to your father and your mother and make things right. And I'm telling you, you will begin to see a change in your life. Not just your life, you will be opening an opportunity for your offspring, for those who are coming behind you and after your lineage. So that's what we learned last Sunday. Favor begins with the parental blessing. I want to move to point number two very quickly here. And believe me, I will just pick where I will reach, I'll stop. Number two, favor God, favor affirms God's blessings and God's promises in your life. Favor affirms. When you get favor, you begin now to see who God is. And number two, you begin to see the promises of God. There are people who are seeking God, but they cannot find him. No wonder Pastor Alan read a scripture here. He said, seek me while I am. Is it not, is it not the scripture you read? While I am found. It means there are moments when you cannot find God. There are people who are trying to look for God in many, in many ways. They are trying to look to, for God in science. Look, they are trying to look to God in the things that they are living, the things which they are doing in their lives. But you can never find God without his favor. No wonder the Bible says it is me who has loved you. Even Jesus says no man can come to me unless the Father draws him to me. So when you are born again, it's the favor of God, by the way. Because there are people who are seeking to be just like you are, but they cannot be. When we look at the people in the world, we think they are like us. They are not. This is why I'm very careful, even with my dealings with the people of the world, because I know they are not like me. I am different from them because God has favored me. And I can tell you, even you in your life, you are not what you are because you are any special. It's just the favor of God. He has drawn you from among many. Abraham wasn't any special. The Lord called him from among his people. Leave your people, your kindred, your father and your mother, and come and I will show you. That's favor. So favor affirms God. And how, did, how does this happen in the life of Jacob? Soon after receiving uh, Isaac's blessings, Jacob started on a journey. And I'm calling it a journey because we have an assumption. There's always this assumption. Because my father is a pastor, 
my children must be believers. It doesn't work that way. We have this assumption, I was raised in a Christian family, so therefore I'm a Christian. It doesn't work like that. I want to believe this moment that Isaac and Jacob are in the land of, uh, uh, the land of Canaan. Don't just assume that they were connected to the God of Abraham, no. Don't assume that they were actually worshipping the God of Abraham, no. Don't assume that. I'm saying this because there was a lot of pressure that was coming upon them. No wonder you can see his brother, Esau, going to marry a woman from among who? The, the, the daughters of? Eh? Hittites. Why? Because there was so much pressure that was there. And many times in our lives, there is so much that pressurizes us that sometimes even the things we, were, we automatically thought were going to be ours, we begin missing on them. So it takes the hand of God even to release our children to know him. That's why as a parent, do your best. Raise your children in the manner that pleases God. But when they reach the age where they can make their decisions, allow God to deal with them. Because when God does it, it's better than you when you force them into it. So in this case here, it had to take now God to reveal himself to Jacob. Because even Jacob himself, as we know, naturally, he was a trickster. The, fa the fellow we are calling here, a deceiver. So God had to now reveal himself. Who is this God whom your father calls the God of Abraham? He had never had a personal encounter with God in the manner that where God is speaking to him. But now as he begins this journey, he has been released to go. God begins dealing with him. And I want us to draw your, your attention to Genesis chapter 28, verse 10 to verse 17, very quickly. 10 to 17. And see now what happens in the life of this man after he has received favor from his parents. Now, heaven is now opening to begin favoring this young man and revealing who God is and what the promises of God are which he gave to Abraham. So chapter 28, verse 10 to verse 17, we see something very significant there. And I want us to read that together. 10 to 17. Please read with me. Are you still with me? All right. It says, Jacob left Beersheba. That's where they were living with, her, with Isaac. It says, and went towards Haran. Remember the map? Haran, eh? The place where they had come from. And he came to where? The Bible begins calling it a certain place. This place is very significant because I will be talking a lot about this certain place. This place is so powerful. And this certain place is where some of us are sitting here today. All right? Some of us walked into the church just to a certain church. But after walking in that certain place, things began to happen. May the Lord begin to work into your life in this certain place where you are. So it says, and he came to a certain place. It doesn't describe the place there yet, but we shall see that certain place. It says, and stayed there that night. To tell me, the young man was going on a very long journey. Very, very long journey. A journey of days. It was not a one-day journey. A journey of days. So he comes and he stays at that place that night. Because the sun had set taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. The father has just released him. The man comes to a certain place. It is now dark. He takes a stone from that place, puts it down as a pillow, and he sleeps on it. Let's continue reading. The Bible says in verse 13, is it 13 or 12? And he dreamt, and behold, and you'll see the word behold is used several times there. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached he to heaven. And behold, again the word behold comes there. The angels, of, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Verse 13. And behold, number 3 again. It says, the Lord stood above it. And the Lord said. Now let me just expl explain here before we see what the Lord said. The word behold draws attention. When you read the Bible, and you come up on the word behold, always know that word is drawing attention. Tazama. It means it's something astonishing. The word behold is something which really is out of the ordinary. So as the man was sleeping, something astonishing happened. The first thing that happened, as we have seen there, he dreamed a dream. And that dream was not just a dream like any dreams that we dream. He saw heaven open. And as heaven was open, he saw a ladder. All the way from heaven, the ladder was coming to the earth. And on the ladder, there were angels ascending and descending. It doesn't tell us angels said anything to him. Angels were just showing what they do. And I'm glad to let you know they are here. Yeah, they are, they are doing what they do best. 
depending on how you receive them. You know, today we preach on demons more than we preach on angels. Everything is just a demon. Everything is a demon. But we hardly see angels. I've been asking God, give me a message on angels. Where we can talk about angels. Because angels are, more, are, are, are better than demons. Do you know demons are fallen angels? So why do we keep on manipulating? I mean, we're talking too much about demons in the church. Instead of us talking too much about it, God didn't show him demons. He showed him angels. Anyway, that's not the subject for now. So the angels were ascending and descending. And then on top of the ladder up there in heaven, there stood the Lord. The Bible doesn't say there stood God. There stood the Lord. To me, I believe, Pastor Joyce, that was the Lord Jesus, who was standing up there. And he began to speak to him. Now, the most significant words are the words which now the Lord will speak. That's why I'm saying the father has just told him, may you receive the blessing of Abraham. But now it is no longer a blessing given by the father. It is now becoming the Lord himself speaking. Favor is when you go beyond the blessings of your father. It's when God begins to deal with you in your own personal way. You didn't get me. Now listen, favor is when you have an encounter with God. And you will realize anybody who had favor with God, the Bible says, and God was with him. Look at the story of Joseph. God was with him and he found favor. Look at the story of Job. God was with him and he found favor. The story of Noah. God was with him and he found favor. The story of Esther. God was with her and she found favor. Every time God begins to give to dispense favor, he must reveal himself to you. And I pray that the Lord reveals himself to us. At least to some of us this morning. So the Lord began to speak. And he said, I am. Can somebody say I am? I am, I am what? The Lord. Look at the word Lord. Capital now. The Lord, the God of Abraham, your father. And the God of Isaac. Now, identity is now coming forward. It, now, God is telling Jacob, listen, now I'm coming to you now to identify myself with you and to let you know who I am. That this journey you are making, you are not alone. I am with you. So he went further. He says, the God of Isaac the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Again, that takes us back to chapter 12 of Genesis. Come and I will show you a land which I will give to your offspring. Now this land now is coming into the custody, into the hands of Jacob. This is now where Jacob is now getting an affirmation. That the land that he's on, he's sitting on, that land will be given to him. But he didn't end there. Look at verse 14. I love it. He says, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you, can somebody say in you? And in your offspring shall all what? The families of the earth be blessed. This is where we come in. That's why I'm saying God couldn't have used any better person than Jacob. To tell you even, it doesn't matter where you come from, he can still bless you. You didn't hear me. You may be short, you may be tall. Some of us are thin. Others, we are fat. Some of us, we are black. Some of us are brown. Others are light. Can I use the word light here? Some are white. They may even be following me online. It doesn't matter who you are. When God's favor comes, he'll locate you. And when he locates you, it will not matter your lineage or where you come from. He will give you the blessing that he has appointed to give to you. This young man, the connection that he had here was this was beginning from here. As soon as the Lord pronounced that I will make you a blessing, the man now connected with what would become what we are here today. This is why those who know the Bible, the whole story of Israel was simply a picture of what the church would look like. And the whole story connects us up to Jesus Christ. And then we are connected to Christ because of this. It would have been Esau, but Esau remained in the land of Edom. The Edomites, those who don't know, the people who are called Edomites were the, the children of Esau. And they faded. They died there. But this man Jacob, because of the promise of God, and because of the identity he had with God, this man now becomes one that God would use to bless all the families of the earth. And this is why it becomes very significant for us to know we are blessed through the promise of Abraham. Now, if it had ended there, you would have said that was simply a, pro a promise that he was given. I want you to remember this man is going to a land that is far away. Where his mother came from. And not near. Can you flash the map? Because if I flash the map, brethren near will understand what I'm talking about. Flash that map media. You know, we think when we read the Bible, 
Jacob is leaving Nairobi, he's going to Naivasha. That's the way you are thinking. What are you thinking in your mind? When he's leaving his father's place, going to the mother's place, where do you think he's going? I'm giving the media time to flash my map. They have my map up there. Do you think he's leaving Kakamega, going to Vihiga? Or is he leaving Nairobi, going to Kampala? Now, I want you to look at that map. You see where Jerusalem is and where Beersheba is. That, that place is the present Israel. But before you, you, you leave, you will go up to Lebanon. You will leave Lebanon, you will go up to Syria. And Syria is just above Iraq. Above Iraq. You yourself, if you know geography and you know how travel is, I believe from, 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 from down there, for you to reach Iraq, where we are up here, it will not take you less than three hours by air. So I want you to imagine that time there was no aircraft. I want you to imagine this young man was given a donkey and he had no servants and he's alone and he knows in the heart I hope you're listening to me. He knows in the heart he's running away from his brother. He knows from his heart he doesn't know what will happen there. He knows from his heart he's going away not to get anything where he's going but he's simply going away to, uh, to make sure that whatever problems he has can be tackled before he comes back home. The man is not carrying any wealth with him because he was not carrying anything. The mother was very careful not to give him anything apart from a little oil that would help him with the desert heat as he was traveling there. And he's on the way going. I want you to put yourself in his state. You have, you, have, you have run away from your mother's place or your father's place. You are going somewhere. You have no idea how the place looks like. Your mother, your father, your grandfather left that place many years ago, hundreds of years ago. And you are now going there to that place running as a refugee, and Aline in that place. What would be the condition of your mind? What would you be thinking in your mind? A situation that many of us are in. You look at the future, you don't see the future. I don't know that I'm talking to somebody here. Sometimes you look at your life and you wonder, really, what is it that can come out of this life? You look at the way things are happening in your life, you don't put, when you put one plus one together, it doesn't add up. But you still, somebody is still telling you, go on, my brother. When you come to Mlema to pray for you, I tell you, just believe in God. I tell you, just trust in God. I don't know the situation that you are faced with. I don't even know what you are thinking. When you look at the future, your children, your wife, your husband, your, 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 I mean, you, don't see, you don't see anything good that is coming ahead of you. This is where this gentleman is, the situation that this gentleman is. But look at what God does. Go back to my scripture quickly. And let's look at that verse that follows where he says you will be a blessed, you, 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 the, the blessed, verse 15. Now, God speaks to him something very significant. And this is now where I want to dwell on for a, just a short while. To let you know when favor comes, it takes care even of your future. When favor comes, brother, let me tell you, if we are favored of God, don't be afraid of your future. You're not getting my point. I'm not, t t turn to your neighbor, tell him, Ndugu najua, mwambia unajua, ingawa ujui, mwambia mi najua unashida. Mwambie. Lakini mwambie ata hiyo shida, mungu ata shukulikea. Nisaidia kuhubiri. Because I'm trying to tell you something. I'm trying to persuade you to believe. Trust in the Lord. You remember our scripture? With all your heart. Eh? Trust in the Lord. And he will give you favor with who? God and men and man. Now, he began to say, and read with me, very powerful. Because this will force the basis of the next point I'll be talking about. He says, behold. Can somebody say behold again here? Behold. This is now God saying, behold. He says, behold, I am with you and I will do what? I will keep you wherever you go. And I will do what? Bring you back to this land. And I will do what? For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have promised you. Now, if God told you that, God himself you are seeing. You know, you people, you think, you think it's, a, it's like a voice in the heart. It was not like a voice in the heart of God. I am seeing God standing in heaven. How many of you believe this book, the Bible? Who, who was speaking? Who was speaking? And where was he speaking from? From where? Heaven. And the young man is seeing. You are seeing God. Assuming Jesus came and stood here. Yesu, umwone ni Yesu. Na kuambia mpendwa, wacha nisutumia luga ya kiroho, mpendwa, mimi niko na wewe, nitakulinda, nitakutunza, nitakuhifadhi, nitakusaidia. 
how will you feel? How many of you will still go back home wondering? I'm asking you, you. Now, I'm looking at it literally. And I'm seeing the Lord himself standing. And the Lord is telling Jacob, Jacob, behold, Jacob, listen, behold. And Jacob is, ah. And God is telling him, listen, as you go, you have no idea. But as you go, my first thing I'm telling you, my presence. My presence. So he began by saying, I will be with you. The presence of God. Favor gives you the presence of God. When you have favor, you are with God. When you're entering that interview room, the presence of God is with you there. Are you not getting my point? The panel is sitting there. And you are, the only, you are among many who have papers. And you, you have to present your papers. Some are carrying files as big as this. I would see them coming for an interview. They intimidate you even before you get into the, in, into the room. The fellows next to you, they have already intimidated you. They keep opening and pulling, pulling certificates and inserting them. You see University of Nairobi, University of Leeds. You see this college which they went to. Now what meant that you have to Kikomba? To a school down in Kikomba here. Now you keep asking yourself, what will happen? But let me tell you, when the favor of God is in you, do you know when you are entering, God is entering there with you? You're not getting my point here. He is with you. This is why I believe as this man entered the land of Haran, he was entering there with God. That's why you will realize everything that Jacob did, the Lord multiplied it. You people, you, I don't know whether you're getting my point. I'm getting excited here. To the point where Laban, Laban the man, after 14 years, Laban told him, I have learned by, by divini, divi, divini, divination is what? Yeah, divi, divi, yeah? These people who do Uganga. Divination. I have learned by divination that all these blessings I have, they have come because of you. Can you imagine an Egyptian telling your boss telling you in the place where you work that I have discovered since you entered this company, this company has prospered because of you. What do you think that is? What is that? And I can tell you some of you since you came to this church, we have really multiplied. You, tell your neighbor where it is GCI in Endelea. Mwambie vizuri, si mzaha. Mwambie tangu kuja kanisa hii. Are you listening to me? Now, can you imagine if your husband tells you from the time I married you, oh, things have never been the same. Or your wife telling you, honey, from the day we just began this thing, our lives have never been, what is that? And you, you, look, you realize where you came from, you, you are found even without anything. You, one dress, And without what? Without even shoes. But now everything is multiplying. Why? Favor. So the Lord told, gave him a promise. He says, listen, I'm going to do two things. Number one, I'm assuring you my presence. And let me tell you, nothing is as exciting as when you have the presence of God in your life. The presence of God. I like the way Ben Hinn used to say, he says, I can lose everything, but I don't want to lose who? The presence of God. Presence. Presence, that's what we need in our lives. When we have the presence of God in everything we do, you wake up in the morning, you know God is with you. Even as you walk out there, God is with you. And for me, I, would, I just want to know God is with me. As, as long as God is with me, I'm okay. His presence. His presence. Can someone say his presence? And then number two, what we call as his provisions. His provisions. If you look at that scripture, it says, I will be with you and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. Settlement. Settlement. There is his presence. What I have written here, he, I, I, in, in three things, I will make sure that I bless you, I keep you, and I preserve you, and I settle you. I settle you. You may be in the wilderness, but let me tell you, God will take care of you there. Number two, he will not only take care of you, he will preserve you. After preserving you, he will return you to the place of settlement. Where even things which you thought can never happen in your life, they'll begin happening because God has settled you. He promised him that. Then he finishes, verse 16 and 17. I thought I'm, I'm done with this point. He finishes by saying, uh, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep. And what did Jacob do? What did he say? He said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know. This is what I told you. It was favor. This was simply what? Favor. 
The man had no idea. I believe this. Can I just finish reading? Then I make, I make my points. Verse eight, 17 and 18. 17 and 18. Then Jacob woke from his sleep, okay? Verse 17, please. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than what? The house of God. And this is the gate of where? Of heaven. So he realized that is the house of God. This is why the word Bethel, it means the house of God. A lot of significance on that. We'll look at it much later. But in verse 18, as we conclude, verse 18, verse 18, 18, please, 18. So early in the morning, Jacob took a stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar. And what did he do? He poured oil on top of it. A lot of significance. We look at that. We look at that. Because some of us, even when God speaks to us, we don't know how to say thank you. You wake up with a dream and you run away and tell people, oh, nearly water. But you do nothing about it. But look at this man. As soon as he woke up, he looked at himself. He says, what do I have? He had nothing. But there was this little oil that had been given by his mother, I guess. It, because the desert has heat. So you have to apply that oil on you as you walk. Okay? To keep you away from the night, the, 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 the heat of the day. To keep you away from the, the, the cold of the night. The man took the oil and he did what? Poured on that oil, raised an altar. And I'll talk about that later. But look at verse 18, 19, and 20. And those verse 18, 19 and 20 are very key to you. If favor will follow you. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was called what? Luz at first. Then verse 20, and I'm ending at that. Then Jacob made a what? A vow. He made a vow. This vow is speaking things which are not as though they are. It's when you begin to speak your future. You begin talking about what God will do for you in the future. You begin calling into effect things which are there, but you don't have them. He made a vow. He said, if. Can somebody say if? When you always come to pray, does it, don't you always have the word if in your mind? He says, if God will be with me. And will keep me. Media, what have you done? If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go. And will give me what? Bread to eat. And what? Clothing to put to wear. Verse 21 says, 21. So that I come again to my father's house in peace. This place where I am. This is my father's house in peace. He says, then the Lord shall be my God. Then he went further and said in verse 22, 22, and I'm ending at that, verse 22, kindly, 22, and God blessed him. Had I finished 21? Somebody changed the chapter. All right, he changed the chapter, okay? All right, let's go to verse 22. Then he says, verse 22, yeah? And of all that you give me, okay, which I have said, and of all that you give me, all that you give me, what will I do? Why are you talking? Why are you reading so slowly? What will I do? I will do what? I will give a tenth, a f not, I'll give a full what? Tenth to you. Then you, verse 23 finishes by saying, 23, if you go to verse 23 kindly, 23, that's the end. Okay. So the man made a vow, and the vow was very simple. He told God, now that you've given me a promise, you're going to be with me. And let me tell you, when God makes a promise, he never fails. It means when God, says, when God speaks in his word and he says, I'm going to bless you, God will never go against what he has said. When he says, I have given you health, he has given you health. When he says he has given you, talk about anything in your life that you're trusting God for. He never goes against his word. So the man says to God, listen, he says, God, he's not making, talking to God. He says, God, now hear me. Where I am now, I'm desperate. I do not even know where I'm going. Where I am now, I don't, I don't even know how the future looks like. But if God, what you've said is true, you will take me where I am going. Okay, I'm not just going to get a wife. I'm going to sit there until my father dies. I'll sit there until my brother is appeased. But if during this season when I'll be there, 
You will be careful to give me food to eat. Those are just the basics. To give me clothes to put on. The basics. And to keep me until I come back to this place where you promised me. Then I'm telling you, everything you give me, I will take a tenth of that. And I will give to you. This man didn't ask for more. He asked for only the basics. But he told God, listen, I know when you will bless me. I will take 10% of everything you have given to me and I will give to you. We are going to be discussing that. But two things which are very significant because I'm closing at this very quickly here. The two things which are very, very important to me here is that this man, first, Bethel. This was the house of God. Bethel. And number two, it is at Bethel that Jacob developed a direct personal relationship with God at Bethel. Number two, it is at Bethel where God expressed or affirmed his presence in the life of Jacob. Number three, it was a place where God promised him provision. I will take care of you. It is the place where God promised him sustenance. I will sustain you where you are. And I want you to flash your mind over the situation that you're going through. Even as you're getting that job and you're starting to work in that place with a very little salary. Very little money. You are not, you, all you are asking God, if, if I can get just some little money for me to be able just to get food for my children in the house or to take my kids to school. God is telling you, listen, even as you go, I will take care of you. I will take care of you. I'll make sure that as you go to that place where there is no, there is no certainty, my presence will be with you there. And I will make sure that I keep you, I sustain you. Until you are, you are done with it, then I will bring you back and settle you in this land. It is not limited to what we think. That's the point I'm coming to. Jacob decided to evoke the blessings of God in that promise. And that's how believers, we evoke God's promise, God's blessings in the promise God has given to us. You may not have it now, but I can tell you, you can evoke the blessings of God over that thing which you don't have for the future. You know, people wait until they have. When they have, it's when they tell God, listen, if you bless me, I will give you. If you will give to me, I'll give to you. But look at Jacob, two things that Jacob did. Two things. Number one, he took what he had, the little that he had. And he says, now that, Lord, you've revealed yourself to me and you've given me your promise, I will give you what I have. The little oil that he had. By faith, the man took the oil and poured it on the altar to signify that, Lord, this is my faith. I'm trusting you now. I have faith in you that you will do it for me. We used to have something we call Thanksgiving. I think some of you can remember. Where somebody would come and give thanks to God and he would say, look, I'm giving thanks to God for this thing because I'm trusting God to give me this thing. That's a principle which many of us don't apply. And thanksgiving does not mean you must have to give. I know some of us think thanksgiving is when you collect what you have give, you, you've been given or what God has given to you, then you come with thanks. There are moments when you can, you can provoke heaven. And I'm not talking about seed offering because that's what many people have capitalized on and they have messed up even the principle of giving. No. What this man was saying, Lord, since you've appeared to me and you've spoken to me, I want to affirm the promise you've given to me by doing something. And he literally took what he had, the little that he had, that's all he had, put it there. And he says, Father, I'm giving this to you to signify that I agree with the promise that you have given to me. After he had poured that oil, is when he says, and if, and if you will take care of me where I'm going. Then he began to make a vow, which I normally call the faith vow of tithing. I know we've distorted the principle of tithing. Allow me to say this before I close. Because we are made to understand, some people are telling us, tithing was a principle of the law, the Old Testament law. But I can discount that and tell you, tithing was not a principle of the Old Testament law. Tithe was not a product of the law. I don't know if you're getting my point. Tithe began by faith. And the first man who tithed was who in the Bible? Where the Bible calls about tithe? Abraham. I'm going to marry to the promise, to the same, same word of Jacob here. 
Abraham, when he had gone to war and he had fought with the kings, you remember the scripture? There were the, the three kings that he fought. And Abraham defeated those kings. The Bible tells me he was with his men fighting in that war. In the land, the land we are talking about, many years before Jacob. And as, as he was fighting with the kings, the Bible tells me somebody from nowhere, his name is not known, came and ministered to Abraham. He gave these people bread and gave these people what? Wine to drink. That man, in the Bible calls him Melchizedek, if those of you who know him. He's called the king of Salem. For those who know theology like my sister here, that is equivalent to our Lord Jesus Christ. From nowhere, somebody came and ministered to those, those people of Abraham. So when Abraham had finished the battle, Abraham came and he told him, listen, because you have minis you min you, you've given me food and you've given me bread, I'm going to give you a tithe of everything that I have collected or I have gathered over this season when I was out there. Then the Bible says, and he gave a tithe to him. That was not law. Abraham was simply putting a principle in place. The principle that when God takes care of you, the only way you can express your trust, your gratitude, the only way that you can tell God I can depend on you as the giver is by me surrendering part of what you've given to me. Am I speaking to somebody? That is Abraham. That is Abraham doing it. And now we are seeing a replica of the same thing happening in the life of Jacob. Jacob is now telling God, listen, now I have nothing. All I have is this oil. And I'm pouring this oil on this altar to signify that this is the house of God. And to let you know this is the place of promise. And you will see this place called Bethel becoming very significant in the life of Israel. He's saying, I'm, I'm consecrating this place with my offering to make sure that this place remains a significant place. And I'm saying, thank you for revealing yourself to me and for giving me this promise. But God, if you will, where I am going, give me food. Give me clothes. But is it just a tithe or full? A full tithe. A tenth. A full tenth. And I will give it to you. Now let me tell you, if you promise God, what do you think God will do now? And that's my point which I'll bring to you next Sunday. If I tell God if you will bless me, what do you think God will do? And I've done it from my heart. I have made that promise with sincerity from my heart. What do you think God will do? I can assure you, the next dealings of Jacob were tied to this vow that Jacob had made. To the, part, the point whereby when Jacob had done now 20 years with Laban, 20 years with Laban, do you know what God said? He says, Jacob, he told Jacob, Jacob, in a dream again, Jacob, remember the vow that you made at Bethel and go back to Bethel. God remembered the vow. He didn't remember anything. But he's not remembering the vow when Jacob is the same Jacob that left the land of Beersheba to the land of Hiran. He's remembering that vow. Maybe I'm jumping in my message. When he has already accumulated so much. Are you listening to me? He has taken literally every wealth that Laban had. The man is full of donkeys. The man is full of cows. The man is full of goats. The man is full of sheep. The man has servants. The man has wives, not one. Two of them. The man has children, 12 of them. 12 children. It's when God is telling him, now, arise from this place and remember the vow that you made for me at Bethel. And go back to Bethel and fulfill that vow. Listen, God will not allow you to come to church when you made a vow without giving you in your, heart, in your hands what you can be able to give to fulfill that vow. Am I talking to somebody? That is my prayer. And I'll close at that. Fervor, when we find it, first we find God. Number two, we find his presence. Number three, we find his provision. Number four, we find his sustenance. Number five, we find his settlement. And at that point, good success begins to follow us. That's where good success begins to follow us. And next Sunday, I'll talk about good success. Marrying it to what I've just said here, 
What now happens when the man wakes up from the dream and go, and I've had this conversation and the man now has arrived in Haran. What now happens? We'll look at that next Sunday. God bless you. Thank you for listening to me. Let me not go beyond the time. Can we stand up on our feet and let's make a prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Media, flash for me, Proverbs 3, 5 to 10, to help us pray. I'm asking God to give me the grace to keep time as we always would want it to happen. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to verse 10. Are you blessed? Now look at that verse. The same, same wordings of that verse are the same ones that have been used in our key scripture that we've been reading in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 4. That is now 3, verse 1 to verse 4. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 4. You'll find if you go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to verse 10, same, same wordings. 5 to 10. Can we read verse 5 to 10? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not Lean on your own understanding. understanding. Verse 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Even if you are like Jacob, the Lord will begin making your path straight. Verse 8. 7, sorry. Be not wise in your own eyes. It says, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Verse 8. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Then verse 10. Then your bands will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with vine. Then number 11, the last one. 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of reproof. Same, same words that we find in the upper chapters there. It means when we put our faith and our trust in God, when we put our hearts and believe God, when we really put our faith in God, and we don't lean on our own understanding. The understanding that this Jacob had was an understanding of, I will go, I will stay, he will die, he will die, I will be told it's okay, I will come back, I'll inherit the land. That was his understanding. But when the man got a dealing with God, the Bible says he will direct your paths. So the many things you've been thinking in your life, don't worry about them. God will direct your paths. The fears you have, the Lord will take care of them. The Lord will take care of them. You could have been going through a lot of fear over, over the future in your life. But the favor of God will help you to overcome those fears. He says he will direct your paths. And he says he'll not only do that. He says he will direct your eyes. Do not be wise in, with you, in your own eyes. The man was very wise in his own eyes. But the Lord had to take away that wisdom that he had in his own eyes. He says if you trust God and you keep his commandments. The Lord and depart from evil. He says he will make even your body to be healthy. Like I said in the beginning. He will give you health in your bones. In your marrows. In other words he will sustain you and give you good life. He will keep you. He will not allow the enemy to take away what God has given to you. Church, we need to come to the place where we can put our faith in God. It doesn't matter what we are going through because when I look, sometimes I, when I just look in the spirit, I see many of us going through a lot of fear. Some of us, we are so depressed with the things which are surrounding us. Sometimes we look at the things which are happening in our personal lives and we feel like God has abandoned us. Sometimes we feel like, why, why did I make this decision to become a believer? But I want you to know something. If you put your faith in God and you trust in God, he will direct your paths and he will give you peace in your life. Father, we thank you. This morning, we give you praise for what you've done for us. Even as we come to the close of this service, Lord, I'm asking you, may you minister to each one of your people that is present here. If there are some of us, Lord, who've been going through difficult situations, I pray the Lord will just come in through for us like you did for Jacob. In the midst of the fears that he had, in the midst of the unknown and the circumstances that he was facing, in the midst, Lord, of a journey that he had never done, he had never made, in the midst, Lord, 
of the uncertainty that this man was going to face, Lord, you revealed yourself to him. And you gave him a promise, I will be with you. I will keep you. I will sustain you. And I'll bring you back to this land and give you a settlement, a possession in the land which I have given to you. Oh God, I pray this morning, may that be the word for your people. Some of us, Lord, have been going through hard times, difficult moments. In our personal lives, in our families, in our workplaces, Lord. In our community where we come from. Some of us have been so depressed by the situations, the environments, the people. That sometimes we, we, we are almost giving up. But I pray this morning, don't allow that spirit to come. Because the word of God stands sure. That your word, when you speak it, Lord, you will perform it. Just like we had it when the pastor was leading us the service here. He will keep his word to perform it, Lord. Do the same in the lives of your people this morning. That if there be somebody here who, is, who feels he needs you, this will be the moment for you, Father, to, for him to turn his life to you. I thank you and I bless you. And I believe, Lord, you've done it to the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. And amen. Pastor Carl. Amen.